Red Redemptions Podcast, starring your hosts, Joe Tweedy, Matthew Johnson, Nick Thomas, and Lynn Dudgeon. Welcome to Nerdentials, your weekly dose of the nerdy essentials covering film, TV, video games, and comic books. It's almost like I rehearse that on a weekly basis, Lynn. Yeah, it it seems like it, although we have been away for a little bit, but... Well, I mean, we did record Nary only a week, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago. Uh, honestly, not that long ago. Well, maybe... Yeah. I. You know what? Semantics. Guys, hey. welcome to the Nerdcast, episode 65. Hey. We are on 65, Lynn. Dang. But to get back on on task here, I'm your host, Joe Tweeden, and joining me in this lowly room of a one-on-one partnership, we have the Lynn Dudgeon. Hey What's going on, guys? Lynn, once again, it's you and me. Yep. Back again. <clears throat> back at it. Guys, the Matthew Johnson is impaired tonight. No, not through alcohol. He's going through some kind of detox, I hear, and it has drained the ever living crap out of him. So, bl- no, 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 no. If we're going to cover this right, we have to do him justice and tell the whole story. There was a challenge thrown down to him. Oh, okay. That, he, that if he could lose weight, he would. Be given the new Xbox. If he could lose more than his counterpart in yeah, said he time. Could lose more, more than his counterpart in said time. But if he is unable to, he loses his electronic privileges. For like a whole so, month, I think. Yeah. That's so nuts. I asked him how he was going to enjoy his new Xbox because there is no losing, <laughs> there's only winning. <laughs> we better hope Godspeed, but, Matthew Godspeed We wish him luck We wish him luck <clears throat> Indeed And, uh, you know, I hadn't heard from Nick Thomas in several days And uh, found out the old chap was doing uh, He'll tell us the story when he comes back next week But uh, he's doing uh, It's not LARPing so much In that it's a reenacting oh. Reenacting uh, medieval, yeah. medieval set battling. Uh, he builds his own armor, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, handcrafted man- armor. Handcrafted and armor, and they they role play legit battles. They actually bash each other up pretty pretty roughly. Um, and the location they went to, he'll explain it uh, next week. But uh, he did not realize there was zero cell phone service in said location. So. Uh, even his wife was unaware of that, and so for four days straight, the old chap was excommunicado with the wife and friends. Needless to say, he needed to patch some things up with the old wifey, so uh, good luck to you, sir, and we uh, wish you back soon. Right. <laughs> so, it shall it shall just be uh, the, the Joe the and the two of us. Uh, yeah, there it is. We- and make it if we try, right. just the two, two of us. us. Yeah, we're going to do it, guys. Here we are. You and I. <laughs> well, let's not drag things out any further, Lynn. Let's jump into our topics for tonight. Deep end? All right. You good with that? Yeah. Huh? All right, guys. Well, yeah, let's... What's first on the docket? Well, What's let's... first on the docket? Well, let's let... hit it. Well, well, well... <laughs> Let's move into Movie Matters, guys. Movie Matters. Because movies matter. At least they do to us. Guys, welcome to Movie Matters. On the top of our list today, we sadly don't have any new reviews. Um, No. and on a side note, Lynn, I do believe I'm going to try to double. I'm going. To, I don't want to promise anything, but I'm going to try to get this episode um, cut and uploaded the same week. Like we're recording Sunday night. I want to get this up by midweek. I do have our previous episode, episode 64, goes up 
Monday morning, guys. It's act, it's ready to launch. It'll be up on Monday. So by the time you guys hear this, I'm hoping you guys might get a double episode this week. I kind of wanted to get us caught up so Ooh. that our news topics are more relevant. Lynn, that's the goal. There you go. And speaking of relevant news, we have a couple key topics here that I've handpicked today that kind of stuck out to me that we could have a little conversation over, if you'll oblige me. Oh, man, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, you cool with yeah. that? Yeah. What you got first? All right, well, first, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in this lightly, because uh, I kind of have mixed feelings on, on the, the whole thing. Uh, guys, Dark Horizons reported uh, earlier this week on Wednesday that Halle Bailey was officially cast as the new Ariel for the Little Mermaid Disney adaptation. Now, uh, I wasn't familiar with her, and I imagine they would want to hire someone who's a good singer because Ariel, there's a lot of key songs in that movie. Uh, so, uh, uh, Halle Bailey is actually an R&B singer of the group Chloe and Halle. I'm not familiar with the, with the gal or her group, but I'm guessing Disney's hired her for her voice more than anything out of this whole bag. And her age range seems to fit all right. She seems in her early twenties based on the photo I'm looking at, um, it says here that uh, filmmaker Rob Marshall spent the last couple of months meeting with talent, but Bailey has reportedly been a clear front runner from the beginning. So, like this, uh, Rob Marshall has had her in his sights for a while, it seems. Um, and on a quick side note, just to tie up what the article had mentioned, we have uh, Jake, Jacob Tremblay. A uh, kid actor from a movie called Before I Wake with Kate Bosworth and Thomas Jane. That was actually a, a, a very interesting, fun movie. I watched it. I recommend it. Um, and Aquafina, lead actress from Crazy Rich Asians. Um, and Melissa McCarthy, currently not official, in talks to play Ursula, potentially. I could see that potentiality, although Melissa McCarthy has lost some weight lately. So, uh... She's not, there's a lot of photos showing her more stout stature up against like the caricature of Ursula. So I mean, yeah. I, I see the comparisons people are making. Might be interesting. So right off the bat, I don't know who Jacob Tremblay is going to play or Aquafina. They, I mean, he could be playing Fla- Flounder, the kid voice of Flounder, perhaps. I don't <laughs> know. Uh, yeah. That that would make sense because um, the kid's young enough. He's like barely. 12 or 13 i think um now the opinion i wanted to throw out there that the internet is of course up in arms about oh is the casting of a black actress in the role of the mythological folk tale known as ariel or at least the fiction that disney created some 30 odd years ago yeah Uh, okay now, for me, if they can get the mermaid imagery down and they can give her... The thing is, is Ariel's kind of an iconic character, and I think that's where the fan base and today's media are colliding. People are okay. upset that they're casting a black actress for a character that is very obviously a white teenage girl with vibrantly unrealistically red hair in all fairness in the original disney animated movie yeah. she was white with red hair that's all i'm comparing right now is just no, what yeah, no. us, us as kids grew up knowing that yeah. as being the traditional image of ariel and and I get it. Mermaids are the argument, I guess, on the other side of, of the field is people are saying, well, mermaids are mythological anyway, so why does it have to be a specific race or color skin? I agree. Right. I agree with the argument. Here, here's here's the other argument that I also bring also bring to the table. Have you seen Ariel's sisters? All, what was it, 12 of them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there were some darker skin gals there, in there, yeah. right? Let, let's be honest. Maybe, maybe in this one, Ariel ended up being the 
the African sister of the group as <laughs> right. opposed to the, the, the white redheaded sister of the group. And right. that white redheaded sister of the group gets the other name. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Yeah. The King, King Trident is kind of, he gets around. Let's, He's kind of a man slut. I mean, let's, let's be honest. He's the king of the land, right? But I mean, if they if if they do decide to try and depict her with red hair, I I feel like she could probably rock it. Well, let's that's, be honest. Well, like, that's the other thing. Give is, her a shot. I'm gonna post a couple fan art pictures that I've come across, and there's some strikingly yeah. beautiful versions with her and red hair. And I I don't think there's. I think that's per, that's great. I don't care. I mean, I I like how it looked. You know what I mean? Um, you can't. So let's I, be honest. Mythological creature. As long as she uh, sings a song and drags a dude to the bottom of the ocean, she's doing her job right. Come on. <laughs> hey, I'm. A, she's just. She's just got to sing. I'm gonna give you a thumbs up on that. I. Uh, <laughs> I. Uh, what, do, what do you call it? Uh, I'd co-sign that. You know. Right. Uh, okay. The. <laughs> The one thing that I associate with Ariel is the fact that she had a voice and she gave that up for something that she truly wanted in her life. Right. So, and, and I think the big, the big key thing to uh, just remember is that the story of the little mermaid is very, very strongly a like a folk tale and it's not grounded in any cultural background it's a culture that disney created it, it would be interesting to see who they do cast as king trident yeah, like I, I mean yeah I if we've think- got her and and but that, no, you brought up an interesting point all her quote unquote sisters had varying or, color had varying color tones and but Tri- but Triton is a pretty strong white ass dude, so it does beg the question: Is there a variety in the genetic pools of mermaids since they're mythological to begin with, or did he have some time around with a handful of other ladies? Right. It, that's it's... that's left to left left to the imagination, as it is a kids' movie, <laughs> and uh, Disney didn't put or too many. Is it? Uh, that's also true. There's a lot of dark uh, historical backgrounds to a lot of Disney films. We should do a little side uh, side episode about those dark histories. There's some fun ones. But I digress. I think the bottom line here is that it's not grounded in cult- in a cultural background. For instance, um, uh, my wife keeps bringing up uh, The Princess and the Frog, Tiana. Now, yeah. that is very strongly grounded in a cultural setting. That is, there's a black community there. Tiana was, I believe, one of the first or the first black princess in the Disney lineup for when it came out. And it takes place in New Orleans. So there's a lot of cultural significance to her character and the story itself. It, w- it was grounded in her character. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, that, that's one of my, one of my... That, no, that is my number one Disney princess movie. Now, let me throw this left hook at you. Uh, one argument I've heard, and I'm not going to name names, is like, well, you wouldn't cast some white southern belle to play Tiana. I'm like, well, yeah, no, that's duh. But that's, yeah. an, that's, an, that's an argument to counterpoint the idea of casting a, diff- a different, ethnically different character for yeah. Ariel. But again, on the, on Ariel's not grounded token, in, in a specific culture. It, it, exactly. Tiana's was that there's a struggle there, and there's they depict both sides of that struggle. Yeah. Whether one being wealthy or one being poor, and that's where that comes from. And it is there is a historical like connection tie there. and significance. Yeah. yeah. And also throwing that out there that she's not a mythological creature. So yeah, that's yeah, I know. So like, I I I don't know. I've had mixed feelings about a lot of different of the live action adaptation choices. Um, I, specifically, I, I, that, that is, specific. My main upset is not who they cast. 
in the actors. My biggest upset about a lot of these adaptations is that Disney is axing out a lot of talking animals from some of these movies. Lion King's an exception. Yeah. I will want to throw this out there. Lion King trailers I've watched recently. Man, like, I appreciate what they're doing trying to make it as close to the original, but I almost feel like it's a copy pasta, dude. I have not heard a single line yeah, that no, no, no. is not identical to the cartoon. It's insane, dude. This CG photorealistic version is like a frame for frame copy of the original. But that's a side right. that's a side tangent. However, the, there's no talking Iago. The, there's no talking parrot in the Aladdin movie, the new one that just came out. And right. And rumor has it, there's no talking dragon in the Mulan movie, the live-action Mulan that whose trailer just dropped at the time of this recording today. Live-action trailer dropped Sunday morning. We and, shall see. I mean, shall see. I'm kind of holding out and hoping they do. I mean, Eddie Murphy's not dead. Recast him. Come on, put him back. He was fun. I'm laugh. And... I'm going to laugh my rear end off if their depiction of Mushu is like the mighty Shinron. <laughs> well, <laughs> that would be hilarious if they're, if Mushu and the live action Milan is Shinron, that would be great. Just a giant dragon with glowing eyes comes out of nowhere. I mean, I wouldn't put it past Disney to make some crazy, uh, animal. My, my biggest, my biggest beef. And I said this off air was the fact that, Mulan is a story of a girl fighting in a man's war, filling in for her father and fighting for her country. And while that story is powerful and very much empowers uh, the woman's story in this culture, in this time period, what five-year-old is going to connect with this? I got to understand because the whole reason they put Mushu the dragon in there with Eddie Murphy is to bring some of that comical relief and to give something cartoony for uh, the kid to connect with. Five-year-old boys. That's what would connect to that. Because it's fighting action sequences and swords. Sure. I, I get it. There's, there's an audience for it. I just feel like Disney would be uh, sorely mistaken for completely cutting out a really wonderful character from that whole story. I'd, I'd yeah, like to see what the representation is for Little Brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that'd be great to see. Uh, that would be. So, guys, we should probably wrap up that topic. Well, uh, yeah. Hold on on that. I got one more I wanted to bring up. Oh, yeah, go uh, for it, Lynn. What's up? I don't know if you saw it, but there were photos released of the pre-production and the start of the filming for Bill and Ted Face the Music. Oh, I've heard Steve about this. Those? I've heard about this Steve being... Photos? I haven't seen the photos, no. I'll have to have you send them to me. Or you can okay. describe them right now and then send them to me. I'll put them in the video. Well, it's, it's freaking... It's Bill and Ted walking into the old school telephone time machine. The phone booth time machine. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like them walking like down the sidewalk, and then Keanu Reeves. It looks like he turns to uh, what's his face? I can't remember his name. Anyway, oh, he yeah. turns. He turns to him, and he looks like he says something. And then off in the grass, in the distance, is the phone booth, and then they both jump into it. And then the other photo that I see is the door closing. But, yeah. I'm nice. kind of excited for it. I mean, uh, what I'll overdo might be a dead horse, might be a freaking diamond just waiting to come out. Now, was uh, Bill, Is it the, it's the same actor, Alex Winter, who plays yeah, yeah, Bill, yeah, Bill S. Preston? Alex. Yep. And Ted. And Keanu Reeves. Dude, I want to... Is this like does 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 Keanu look current, or did they try to make in the in these photos, or did they try to make him look a little more like classic Bill and Ted? No, he looks current. A little and, more. It's like a present day tale of yep. Bill and Ted. Yep, it looks like he stepped off the set of John Wick. Okay, yeah, I'm looking at the photos right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't even care, dude. 
Keanu Reeves is in everything right now, dude. He's he's right. in the. Did you see? Uh, for the I know we didn't cover a lot of E three this year, but dude, he's oh, in the, pre- the the presentation for uh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, uh, dude. Freaking Robin and I reserved that today. That's not one I think you're gonna regret. That of nope. games you reserve, that's not gonna be a regret, dude. Oh, oh man, I love the tabletop so much, and I'm hoping that they do right by it and they do a good representation. And it's awesome; it's coming out in 2020, which is the original date for Cyberpunk, right? The yeah. tabletop game. Yeah, that'll be so sweet. Um, I but I was, I it. just, I was just going on about Keanu being in so much with the John Wicks, the Ted, uh, and a video game, dude. And I guess he's a really laid back, uh, cool guy to talk to based on some interviews I've seen recently. <clears throat> so oh, he's, I love a guy with that much talent who still has kind of his head down to earth. Humble. He's very humble. That's what I'm, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. And like, dude, he's, he's kind of up there with, I'm not talking about personality, but as far as movie skill wise, he's kind of up there with Tom Cruise as far as one of the few actors that wants to do all their own stunts. Like Keanu Reeves does, he trains for months and does all his own fighting in 90% of the movies he's in. Like in John Wick, there's, there's almost never a single double, uh, in there for any of those stunts. It's all him. Really? Yeah, dude. He, he is like the Jet Li of this generation or the Jackie Chan dude. Like, and Tom Cruise is just straight up crazy. He purposely will (laughs) stop production and says, no, I want to train on a jet because he wants to do the real damn maneuver in the, in the latest movie that he's getting, got into with Mission Impossible. Like, dude, he seriously stopped production so that he could get hands-on actual training for flying, flying a, an F1, F12, something jet, whatever, you know, a jet, freaking dude, an actual jet. Like, 50, 60-year-old Tom Cruise is like, no, we're going to stop production. I want to train how to do this because I'm going to do the scene. He he's nuts. Tom Cruise is the modern nut job, and Keanu Reeves is the modern Jackie Chan dude. As far as like doing all his own stunts, it's insane. Fair enough. I uh, and top of being humble, kind of kind of makes you really look up to the guy, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, did you other than the Bill and Ted's? Did you have anything else on that? I didn't mean to like go on a side tangent no. there. No, you're good. I mean, I just wanted to bring it into the light and kind of make the hype chain start going for it because yeah i've heard other podcasts mention the the bill and ted face the music and i didn't know how far along it was so that's cool we're starting to see uh production photos for sure for sure uh second topic guys in movie matters um well third topic now that i just kind of wanted to briefly touch on haven't gone out to the theaters to see it i'm hoping to see it in the next week or two i don't know who else will be able to join me on that? But Spider-Man: Far From Home is oh. uh, is is doing really well right now, guys. Um, Dark Horizons reported that um, it had a strong start. It generated thirty nine point two million on the opening day, which was a Tuesday, July second. That which is kind of interesting. It, like Thursdays are the new premieres, but this came out on a Tuesday for some reason. Um, try to beat that Fourth of July weekend, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, I uh, it's, see it. It said that figure sets a new benchmark for Tuesday ticket sales, topping the record previously held by 2012's The Amazing Spider-Man, who made 35 million at the time. It's expected to earn uh, Far From Home is expected to earn 125 million during its first six days in theaters though with good word of mouth it could rise as high as 150 uh spider-man homecoming debuted at 117 million over a three-day frame ahead of the uh, an 880 million worldwide uh right now i saw another article it's not listed here but it looks like right now spider-man could be seeing over 600 million worldwide worldwide in its first week wow which, I mean, for a Spider-Man film, that's huge, and it's coming off the coattails of Avengers Endgame, and no spoilers here right now, guys, um, but 
this does have a lot of connection. It's uh, The Russo brothers came out and said that this was going to be the epilogue to Phase 4. It's like kind of like it ties up a few concepts and kind of pushes the end of the story of what of the things that happen in Endgame. We're gonna see some of that the results of Endgame in the Spider-Man movie. Uh, so it's very much directly connected, even though it's a standalone film. And they said it is the epilogue chapter to Phase Four. So anything after Far From Home will be the entire an entire new phase. So. Uh, and, and Lynn, I know we've teased with others. I, it's really, it's come down to at this point, we're just trying to get all four guys in the same room together. Cause so right. far the last three episodes in a row, we've been missing one of the guys. We're trying to get all four of us together so that we can do an Avengers end game spoiler cast for fun. I know it's been done already, but we just want to give you guys our two cents and then hopefully we can follow it up with the Spider-Man Far From Home since it connects so closely with Endgame. It would be fun if we could, if we could all go see that soon and do a back-to-back. Uh, hey, I want to do a back-to-back spoiler cast that, on both of those. That would be kind of fun to do when I come up to visit. Well, that's my I, thoughts. I cause, go and see it. Because listeners out there, uh, in about a week and a half, two weeks, Mr. Lin will be visiting me here in the studio. Uh, oh. both to spend time with us, uh, with family and friends, but, uh, we might do a recording then and maybe we could, yeah, I was going to talk my wife into letting us go cause my wife's behind on the movies right now. So I, we're not going to go see Endgame and try to go see Spider-Man. I'd rather just you and me go to Spider-Man, knock it out. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could take the boys. I don't know. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They'd well, enjoy it. We'll see how it goes. Well, I know Emmett, Emmett still like binge watches Homecoming. So does he? Uh, what about yeah. Into the Spider Verse? Does he still go to that? That well, that we watched that on. Robin just flat out bought the director's cut that's got all the extras to it. Heck yeah, so dude! His, dude, that he watches. He watches that one at least twice a day. <sighs> that Spider-Verse. movie, that movie's worth it, dude. That one is so good. Oh yeah, but I, hey. Uh, concluding, um, just want to kind of get your thoughts on this last topic. Uh, again, we don't have much for TV talk, so we could spend an extra few minutes on movies. Um, I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, another uh, article came out regarding the casting uh, for Warner Brothers Pictures. Uh, let me just read it here. This is about the live adaptation for the manga anime Akira. Now, <laughs> now, now, before before going into it, uh, so I know so many people have said, "No, don't do it. That's the one anime that should never be adapted. Don't do it. Don't do it. Hollywood will screw it up like they did with Ghost in the Shell." I and agreed. Like, there's a lot of concern. I mean, I don't know how, how. Did you like Ghost in the Shell? What was that with uh, Scarlet I Scar Joe? I, Scarlet Johansson. I didn't. I didn't watch that one. If okay, we're being honest, it I, it, it got reamed critically, dude. So like, I haven't even given it a chance. So I can't speak on a personal opinion on the matter. I just know what so many other fans have felt about it, and it was very yeah. divided and messy, at best. So. so sure. So going into this article, I just want to lay out here what I what I read in this today kind of encouraged me at at what we could get oh. from from this adaptation. What what the about what the director said, right? Both the director and what it, what type of individuals are being cast for it. So let me read this article. Yeah. Uh, it says here a casting call for a Warner Brothers picture film titled. Box 28, an apparent coded title for the upcoming Taika Waititi directed live action adaptation of the classic manga anime Akira. Now, on a side note, did not have any idea that Taika Waititi, infamous for Thor Ragnarok, was involved in actually directing this. So that alone has my sights now looking towards this. And, and I'll read further. It says, um, 
it was found online at backstage.com. The list seems to confirm Watiti is doing what he says he would and is seeking out Japanese and Asian actors to portray the main characters as opposed to previous failed attempts to adapt the property which tried to get white actors like Leonardo DiCaprio, Garrett Hedlund, and Gary Oldman to star. Like, what? The previous version of Akira, they were trying to get guys like that. Now, all great actors, but not for this film. You don't put those guys in it. An anime, an anime from the 80s that's so as iconic as this, you don't put those guys in there regardless of how good they are. I'll, re- <laughs> I'll continue. Uh, it says, It's not clear if the failure and backlash again uh, against another recent cl- uh, celebrated anime to film adaptation, Ghost in the Shell, had any impact. I'm sure it did. Names in the casting one sheet have been changed. But it's fairly clear who the roles are. Here are the eight parts being sought. Now, I won't read through all of them, but are you familiar with any of the general characters from Akira, Lynn? Yeah, that's kind of one of the ones that Robin and I watched a lot. Okay, 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 okay. So that being said, so um, because it's all... With with casting sheets, um, a lot of people not in the know about how Hollywood operates... When it comes to casting calls and stuff, a lot of times they'll input a um, a replacement name for the character actually going to be in the movie because it's all you know it's all behind the scenes in code. That's why the the film name is not Akira; it's called Box Twenty Eight, and the actors being cast, like the character names, are going to be different than what we see in the anime. Because right now, every all the details are hush hush, and there's constantly news reporters trying to leak information and and dig in deep and find out what's really going on. Um, So for June, or Jun, I might be getting these wrong on the pronunciations. You can correct me, Lynn, if I've gotten them wrong. But June, I think that's the lead character. Uh, Or really, Kaneda thereafter. Uh, They're looking for male... Kaneda. Kaneda, okay. Uh, Male, 18 to 24, to play Japanese, English-speaking, must be legal, 18 to 20s, to play an 18-year-old character. He's described as sharp-eyed, sinewy, probably read that wrong, tough, handsome, and cool. He is the leader of a street gang of teenagers and knows how to have a good time. Uh, Jun should not be too cool or too tough. He's a scrappy, ragtag kid who's not worried about anything your weird, natural, authentic self is encouraged. And that's what they're looking for. Um, for Koichi, who is really probably the character of Tetsuo, also, same. All a lot of these are going to be the same. 18 to 24 plays Japanese, English speaking. Um, he is constantly forced to punch up in order to survive. He's fearless to the point of recklessness. He is haunted by the loss of a loved one. And we got uh, Ki, or Kai... Key, female, uh, described as beautiful, intelligent, strong-willed, a member of an anti-government organization trying to save her city. You've got uh, Kaori, uh, female. Uh, here's and once it gets down to the secondary characters, like those first ones, they were it's it was calling for Japanese, English speaking, like a requirement. Now these secondary uh, roles, it puts in parentheses. Uh, f- for Kaori, it's looking for a female to play Asian, English speaking, and in parentheses it says Japanese a plus. Because the thing is, is like they they want to cast a hundred percent Japanese because that's the like authentic origin of this story. It's a Japanese manga. Yeah. But they are allowing for different Asian descents as long as they can get you know the mostly aesthetic appeal to this whole story as close as possible. So that's just my well, are assumption. They, are they are, are they doing the article that I read it was gonna be like a kinda like a series, not a, a full remake of the movie. Is uh... that what's happening or are they making a full remake of the the movie? This one, this specific article with Taika Waititi helming it seems to be 
a film adaptation. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip what? ahead to the end of the article because uh, okay. I mean it's I'll just list the other characters. It's got uh, Yamagata, uh, Kaisuke, uh, Takashi, or Masaru, uh, Kyoko, and that's kind of the li- the extent of what's being cast. Uh, are you yeah. smiling because I got some of those wrong? <laughs> Slightly, dude. Yeah. I'm not good okay. with Japanese names. I I told you. No, you. don't. No, don't even don't even sweat it. It's all right. Um, but the end of the article says the casting call sheet does not list any dates for the project. Watiti's quote Joe Ra- uh, Jojo Rabbit is expected to play the fall film festival circuit, and more answers about this production will probably be forthcoming then. So you're not wrong or right. It could be a series, a mini series, but I'm. It well, sounds. That, that... So- like the the trailer that I saw for it, it it kind of had like a paranoia agent esque type thing where yeah. it was the, the skateboard floating through space, hitting the satellite, and then a guy in a spacesuit with no of none of his lines attached to anything, just holding the skateboard yeah. on the moon. So it made it seem like it was going to be a series, and it was going to be based on the manga. I was, uh, my primary excitement for seeing this article was just the connection with Taika Waititi, uh, the fact that they're looking for an all Asian cast, uh, Jap- <clears throat> and so those were my two highlights for this thing as like, and, and in the article, it does make the comparisons of ghost in the shell as being a failure, uh, with, with trying to do a, you know, quote unquote whitewashing actor role and it just didn't do well. Well, I mean. So it, I thought, like with this one right here, like going back to our Ariel and Tiana topic. Mm-hmm. Okay, these aren't mythological creatures here. The story no. was based on Japanese characters. It wasn't based on American characters. Oh, and when I say whitewashing, so, that's the term being no, thrown around. No, but I, no, I, I I get that, and Hollywood everywhere kind of tries to do that just to i guess socially yeah. accept it within these the states but and well it's, not it's just one of those things that well then not just that i don't mean to cut you off but i just do want to point out regarding the you know why they cast certain people and why we perceive it as whitewashing uh, hollywood tries to cast uh ticket selling names and so often they yeah. often they overlook the ethnical cultural background behind what makes the story important. And they just look for the scar Joe of this. They look for the, con- the, uh, the Tom yeah. Cruise, uh, for instance, what, um, Ronan, Ronan, wasn't that Keanu Reeves? And, uh, and what was that Tom Cruise? He was raised up in like a, a Chinese or Asian. I forget. It was the last samurai Tom Cruise is in the yeah. last samurai. Or Matt Damon in The Wall, the the Great Wall of China. Matt Damon was in that damn film. It's like they cast yeah. the cast ticket selling actors. But you're gonna you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot doing that. No, it's, and and Hollywood not... Hollywood's starting to realize that. I mean, it's 2019. It's not all of Hollywood, but a good chunk of them are starting to reevaluate who they put and and what and who they cast in their films. Now, you could see that there's started the we've seen some significant yeah, movement. It, it yeah, I get you. I mean, I, I, I get what you're I, saying. And, I should I shouldn't say in the in in this instance right here it really needs to be like the the Tiana type aspect where there's a history with this story and the characters are of a certain descent or a certain race. Yeah. And that's how they need to be. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing is like when we, when, when we talk about representation in Hollywood, there are more and more ethnically diverse actors in Hollywood that are getting awards and, and doing incredible work and that's the thing. I think that's the thing that the reason these uh, groups of people get frustrated with in Hollywood even is because it's like, like I said, Hollywood goes for the big ticket names 
and they happen to be white people. But well, how are but how are the, you going to find find the next star if you don't give that person the opportunity? Yeah, no, I mean, valid point. It's, it yes. Comes, it, com- yes. it comes down to, okay, there's that guy who knows how to make this one part. Okay, he's really good at making that one part, and everybody wants that guy making that part. Okay, when that guy dies and there's no successor to that person, what do you got? You don't you don't have that yeah. part anymore. No, you make a perfectly you, valid point, Lynn. You, when- you got to have a successor, and the only way you're going to do that is if you introduce the diversity into the 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 scheme of things because not there's not always going to be that one square peg in the square <laughs> hole sometimes yeah. you do have to round the edges off and jam something else in there that somehow works and works great because they're and, and to fluid. and to add to what you're saying to add to that I what I, what I was uh, initially getting at to coincide with what you're saying is is that Hollywood is starting to give some of these other actors more chances because there is legitimate talent behind there. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o, beautiful, gorgeous black actress. She um, Jordan Peele has uh, put her in the most recent film, Us. Uh, she played one of the characters in Black Panther, uh, she's starting to get more and more bigger roles, um, and she's well, see, she's incredible. I I would like to shake Peel Peel's hand and just thank him for giving <laughs> yes. them the opportunity. You know what I mean? Yes. I there's there's a lot of people out there that I don't I don't want to play the racist card or the discrimination card against it like saying there's all the things that they say but without him giving these people the opportunity those roles in the future that might not necessarily have been written for a certain race or whatever these actors will now have an opportunity at being cast for those yeah and and i it opens up doors i can I can appreciate it because you know they're they're not talent just talent, cast. Dude. They're not just cast for the color of their skin. They're cast for their ability to play a role, their ability to deliver a line or deliver an emotion that you feel that you can connect with or that you're mm-hmm. genuinely afraid of in a movie. Yeah, so one hundred percent. And yeah, I like. I'd I'd like to shake his hand. I not on like a political or no any just, just the fact that he's giving these people an opportunity that he's giving others an opportunity that they might not necessarily have been given. Yeah. Uh, and, and I I appreciate what uh, Taika Waititi is doing here. He's he's pushing for an all Japanese cast in this Akira adaptation, just to bring it full circle here. And, yeah. You know? And with, on that note, he might introduce someone that uh, American casters might not have seen before. Mm-hmm. And then they'll be given the same opportunities. And yeah, you never, we might, we might find like the next Asian Tom Cruise. And I, and I'll put it and I'll put it in our own stunts. And well, we, you know, and I'll put it this way. Like, I mean, we, we've had Jackie Chan and Jet Li and granted they've kind of sequestered into odd, odd roles nowadays, but in their prime, they were masters of the martial arts. They did their own, their own everything in their movies, but, not in American mainstream, perhaps no, no, no. for I, some of it. I, I, I would like to bring a caveat to them and their roles and the American, like the Hollywood yeah, I know depiction what, of that. I know what you're saying. And, yeah. and, and you can put their roles into a box and they're all similar. And that's the thing that yeah. really kind of, kind of sucks. But with this, it's also what they're changing up now, nowadays with yeah, this that, new talent that we're that, bringing in. Exactly. And with this, opportunity here with the uh this new adaptation 
there there's not just action you know kung fu Mm -hmm. it's you you have the ability to have that drama aspect thrown into the mix you know and it could it could turn out great and different and i only way to tell if something is going to be good is to let it happen and see if the if the representation of it is is well and or well received and you just have to wait and see it's one of those things you got to give it a chance you you always have to give it a chance yeah dude i am i'm very excited about the future of people directors like jordan peele and taika watiti to see what kind of what kind of motions and moves in the industry they're going to make well wasn't wasn't alita battle angel very well received as well i believe so i haven't actually checked on the numbers since i had originally done a trailer reaction to it but but it had it had great views when it came out didn't it i believe so and that and was that also was pro- that was also grounded like a lot of CG heavy, but that was that movie was also grounded in its original source material, which was uh, Japanese manga. Like that's where it was sourced from. There's a long running series about Alita Battle Angel, um, yeah. and Robert, Robert Rodriguez was given the reins from James Cameron, and that was always a pet project that James Cameron wanted to produce, but of course he's gotten so tied up with his Avatar <laughs> shit <laughs> that. Uh, he, he put it into the hands of someone else, but, um, he still is an act, was an active producer on it. So it's got the James Cameron stamp on it and it was, it, well, it was well received. Huh? Yep. The approval stamp. Yep. The JC stamp. Anyway, any other, any other points you want to make on that or, or should we move forward, Lynn? No, we can move forward. I feel like I blabbered on and we had a good ba- a Lynn, we, bit there. we had a, a bit good, there we had a good back and forth it was a really good topic and something on a more heavier uh real aspect that we don't touch very often I, well i i guess my concluding statements for that is there are certain stories that are told that aren't delivered the way that you want to see it and you have to give it the chance yeah it's yeah. it's just one of those things that not everything is going to be the way that you would care to see it done like the end of game of thrones but <laughs> like there, there was a lot of people that were hurt by it but you know it's the way that they wanted it to end and we, i we almost made it out of this topic clear and free from hate and uh, you had to go throw <laughs> game of thrones into there <laughs> right i'm but, kidding i'm kidding but no, you make it, a valid point yes it, it's good and it, it's just one of those things you got to that's the way that the story was told by the people who wrote it and you've got a deal you really do you I mean, if you want to see it done a different way, put in the time and the effort and do it yourself. And then if yours, if yours is, if yours is better, like our PUBG and freaking <laughs> Fortnite discussion that we had a long time ago, the if your game is better, it's gonna prevail over the top of the other one. And yep. <laughs> so, and here, here we are right now. Both games are about freaking neck and neck. So, I mean, it just comes down to make your game better. <laughs> yeah. End of story. Courtesy yeah, of Lynn Dudgeon. Right. Well, guys. On that note, let's jump over to a brief segment we like to call TV Talk. (laughs) Well, guys, it's TV Talk, and um, we don't have a lot as far as news goes. I do want to put, put this out there. I've only, personally, I've only managed to get the first episode down 
of Stranger Things Season 3. Now, guys, don't worry. We will give an appropriate spoiler warning before we do any kind of spoiler cast. But that being yeah. said, Lynn's going to kick it off this week. Nick and Matt have already gotten... Uh, Matt's done with it. Nick is neck deep in it right now as we record this. Spending some quality time with his wife, as I said. And uh, me and Lynn will get caught up through it over this next week. Guys, we're going to give you guys a whole extra week before the nerds here bust out a full spoiler cast, as we did with Stranger Things Season 2. I think that was episode 20 or 21 and 22 of our old, of our, of our current podcast. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a minute. It has been. It's been a minute. I think 21 or 22, guys, just go searching Nerdentials, uh, Stranger Things Season 2, if you guys want to rewatch or relive those moments. We'll do a recap for you guys of Season 1 and 2 before we dive into Season 3, and then we'll do a full spoiler cast on said season uh, probably next week. But for now, I will just say this. I'll just give you my, my brief inclination of Episode 1. I am so super excited, dude. I just I love everything about what I've seen in in episode one and just the the feel. It's the dead middle of the eighties. I think it's supposed to be nineteen eighty five. The kids are, you can tell it's hard for them to try to get this series and keep them young, because yeah. they're right in that where they're right at that age where puberty is about to kick for all of them, and it's only been a few months, you know, about half a year since last season. But it feels the way they look, I'm going to be honest, it feels like a two or three year jump just because of freaking puberty, dude. <laughs> like they kept, they kept the clean, like the, the faces are squeaky clean and they got the same hairstyle as best as possible, but you can tell they've grown a little bit. Um, it's just, it's just the nature of it, dude. Like they look like kid kids in season one and two, and now they look like teenagers in season three. I don't think that's gonna. I don't think that's going to diminish the story here. Yeah. Uh, time will tell. Only eight episodes this season, guys. Um, but right now, just the kickoff of, of of getting all the gang back and seeing all our favorites from season two come back here, and seeing just a couple little little bit of twists and changes in them growing up with each other and be, you know being a little bit older in this season. I can say right now, I am full blown sold on board for the ride of this season. I'm going to binge the crap out of it before next weekend. I I'm I'm legit excited about it. Matt gave me a brief uh, statement, but it was more like a couple words to describe his feelings of the finale, and it it was kind of a a jumbling of wait what what and then he ended with oh my gosh <laughs> and i'll leave it at that i'll let matt convey his thoughts next week but that's kind of what he shared with me about the finale so uh, from what i've seen in, in episode one to how matt reacted with the finale i lynn we're all going to thoroughly enjoy season three and it should be interesting to see what we have to say about it come next weekend that being said, guys, be prepared for a spoiler tastic next episode, and we will put all the warnings ahead of time so you guys know. I'm giving you guys a warning now. It's on Netflix now. Watch it. Watch through it, and then join us for the conversation next week. Come visit us. Come visit us. But I do have one short uh, smaller review to hit on uh, one other series that I kind of got into with my wife. It was kind of at a random whim on her on our days off together. We'll put the kids to bed and we'll pop Netflix on and be like, uh, "What do you want to watch?" And this particular night, uh, she came across the show Good Girls, which is currently on Netflix. It's an NBC show. They're two seasons in. Both seasons are on Netflix, and uh, my wife told me 
you know, friends at work had said it's good. They recommended it, this, this, and that. And, oh, it's really good, talking a lot about it. I'm like, all right. She she scrolled over to it, and because there's so much stuff to watch, and it's so hard to pick and choose, and especially with a significant other, you're like, oh, no, what do you want to watch? And the other one says, I don't know. What are you into? What do you feel like? It's back and forth for like an hour and then half your night's gone. You're like, well, we better pick something now or it's going to be too late to watch anything. You know what I'm saying, Lynn. And I'm sure people out there have had similar feelings. So she scrolled over it. She said, people have really been talking about this. I said, hit play. So she hit play. We just jumped right in without any thought. I'm like, no, I'm not going to waste our whole night trying to figure out what to watch. So we hit play, and guys, two hours later, we were three episodes in, and we called it a night, and we were so hooked into it that we watched three more episodes the very next night. Um, I can say right up front, I will just give you guys the, the brief synopsis for it, who's in it. Um, the idea is that three suburban mothers suddenly find themselves in desperate circumstances and decide to stop playing it safe and risk everything to take their power back. It's a little broad, but I'll break it down a little bit more. Uh, starring Christina Hendricks as one of the moms, uh, Retta. She's been in a couple things lately. She just goes by the name Retta. Uh, she's played a lot of smaller roles um, she's an actress known for Parks and Recreation. She was in the 2007 film Fracture and uh, 2017 film Father Figures. Um, funny African-American actress. Uh, and she co-stars along with uh, Mae Whitman. Now, she looks familiar upon first glance, but uh, she was known as... Uh, she played Mary in uh, The Perks of Being a Wallflower... Uh, she played in Scott Pilgrim, uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. I'm trying to think of what did she play? Um, oh, well you, you're familiar with Scott Pilgrim, right? She played Roxy Richter was the character she played. Um, and she looks like another actor. She looks like she could be related to Miley Cyrus almost. Just in her face. Uh, when you see a picture, you'll know what I'm talking about. But anyway, guys, um, it's about... Man, is it really 45 minutes? Huh. Guys, the episodes kind of whip by pretty quickly, but it's a 45-minute show, 43-minute average. Um, it's on NBC. Two full pilots, uh, 10 episodes and 13 episodes, so 23 total. Looks like it's been approved for a season three. I am six episodes into season one. I uh, can plan on continuing to binge it. Um, think um, Housewives meets Breaking Bad. And, and by that, I mean it's like if, if Walter White was replaced by three housewives and each of them have a unique like challenge they're dealing with in life. Uh, let's see. One mother's husband is cheating on her and they've got like four or five kids and she's trying to just get by, uh, kind of knowing that he's cheating. Um, uh, the, uh, the other friend, Retta, she's got a kid with like illnesses that need a lot of medical attention and it's one of those things that's really severe that it's like, you know, 10 grand a month to be on these pills. And that's her husband's getting into law enforcement and she, they don't have a very good paying jobs at the moment. Um, the other girl um, played by Mae Whitman, she is the sister to the first mom with the cheating husband. And she herself has been divorced and and has a, a daughter that's kind of hitting into those um, 14, 15 teenage year range. She's a single mom, um, and she's got short hair, and and she's being teased as being a boy. So there's this whole, you know, 
gender indifference with kids at her school and bullying and stuff. And so the single mom is, you know, trying to be supportive as best she can while working minimum wage at a, you know, as a cashier. So they get tied up in the first episode. They get caught up with, uh, they decide to rob a freaking grocery store, dude. Episode one. Like they just, they joked about it at first. Huh. They're like, you know, oh, we're they're struggling with this. The one mom needs a crap load of money for medication for her kid. Uh, husband's cheating, kicked her husband out. So now she and realizes that the husband had invested in wrong things and that they're going to lose their house. So in, in addition to losing, possibly losing their house and him cheating on her. So she's dealing with that. The sick kid. And the single mom, they're, the single mom jokingly said while they over wine and whiskey, they're like, oh, hold on. Uh, lost my ears. <laughs> well, good thing for detachable cords and not ruining them, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, that was awkward. Uh, yeah, all these kind of life life-changing challenges and... The one girl just jokingly says we could rob a store. And then the mom with multiple kids, a husband she's probably going to divorce and possibly losing their house. She just kind of says, why don't we do it? And next thing you know, all three of it, because the one cashier, she knows that they keep 30 grand in the vault in the back room. So like, that's enough for us to, you know, fix a few things, you know, real quick. And and she works there, so we could we could pull it off. She knows how to get back there, so they do it. They go ahead and do it. And as they're bagging up money, uh, they take it all home and they start counting the money. And they're like, I can't believe we just got away with that, right? And the the one chick, the cashier, has a small stack of money and and says. They're like, well, how much do we have? And she's like, uh, well, it's more than 30 grand. And they're all like, how much more? Like, how much do we have? And next thing you know, she starts picking up one bag, dumping a pile of cash, grabs another bag, dumps a pile of cash on top of what she already counted was at least 30. And then now she's showing how much more seven bags she dumps onto the table and then you, they do a quick cutaway, and they all start freaking out because they have close to five hundred million dollars sitting on their kitchen table. And the question that immediately comes to their minds is, "What grocery store has half a billion dollars in their safe?" And they realize this is more than just grocery store money. It's laundered money. Done. Dun dun, and that kicks off the whole show. That's all in episode one. We're like, they're like, oh, hey, I know, crazy idea. Let's just rob a grocery store and maybe fix a couple of our problems right now. Oh crap, we got a lot more money than anticipated, and it doesn't belong to the store. So that's enter the whole kind of a Breaking Bad angle where they kind of get in over their heads. And some some heavier individuals are involved, and 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 it does kind of that Breaking Bad twist. Where spoiler alert, guys, if you guys haven't seen Breaking Bad, it's been out long enough. You guys should have seen it by now. It's an incredible show. Uh. But it's that whole thing where Walter White tries to fix a problem by by doing a little something not so cool and not so legal. And then he gets tied in with someone bigger who wants more from him. And next thing you know, he, he it's a snowball effect of him getting deeper and deeper involved. This is the exact same layout. They, they think they can take care of it. They get involved with some shady people. And next thing you know, they seem to have taken care of things. Like, okay, we can go now, right? But wait, there's something more here. And it's a similar drive. Walter Wright... Walter Wright has cancer and he wants to take care of his family before he dies. So his whole drive is to keep doing it, even though it starts getting heavier and harder to do. So these moms kind of go through the same thing. It's a different setting, different characters, different personality. 
it sounds like the same story, but guys, it is a lot of fun and it's it's got a lot of well balanced humor with the drama. I can't wait to see how the first two seasons that are already out, and some of you guys have already seen it, so I might be behind. But guys, if you haven't seen it, Good Girls is on Netflix, so go get it if you're looking for something new and fresh that you're that you're not currently into at the moment. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Current six episodes. I'll wait till the season one ends to give my full rating, but I'm gonna give it an eight out of ten right now. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's like I said, it's not super original, but it has some interesting twists that make it different from the norm that we've seen. So I'm gonna put eight out of ten on that. Um, Lynn, that's gonna kind of potentially wrap up TV talk as you kind of shake odd, yeah. oddball your head around in agreement. I, you got nothing. Yeah, I've been to, working. Yeah, time. haven't really had time to really check out shows lately that's all right dude i've only i just i'm kind of on the side i'm keeping up with trying to catch up with lucifer and then me and the wife got hooked into good girls but that's kind of it you know nothing extra beyond that so no worries dude it's all right we talked a lot for movies so about 15 minutes in tv talk um we have a few things to maybe just briefly talk about before we wrap up with some gaming stuff so let's roll that beautiful Gaming Bits footage. <laughs> Guys, welcome to Gaming Bits. This is going to wrap up our third segment for the Nerdcast tonight. Um, I don't have a lot of news. E3 happened, but it kind of came and went, so we're not going to deep dive into any of that. Oh. What we will do. Well, that, <laughs> that was a thing. That was a, that was a thing that we kind of sort of missed, and we've usually been good at covering it. But what I will say is this, Lynn. As we get trailer releases on a lot of these things that hit E3, we'll touch base on them in our show. Rather than yeah. trying, you know, I mean, we're excited about a lot of things that came out of that, but it was kind of the pre-show to the exciting show which I feel is 2020 where the next gen consoles are nearly guaranteed to release. And I don't mean, I I just mean like me and Uh you aren't ready to buy the next gen, but there would be a lot to talk about because we're going to be on the cusp of that release. I just bought my Xbox one. I am not prepared to buy another console yet. (laughs) Don't even, don't even stress, Lynn. We'll, we will wait till that, till that, you got till fall, dude, of next year. So that's a whole year from now. Who knows what will happen? Who knows what will be enticing enough to make the jump? We'll wait and see. It's kind of one of those things. Let's just wait and see, you know? Yeah. But in the meantime, guys, news aside, and, and on, on a, on a side tangent to my side tangent, We've got a lot of Destiny conversation to have soon. Uh, we haven't updated our core audience here at Nerdentials yeah. about what we've been playing. But all four of us have, have been thoroughly invested in Destiny over the last couple months. Uh, so we're going to give you guys, probably next week or when we get the rest of the guys together, we'll do kind of a, just a state of the game on Destiny, how we feel about its future and where it's going. Well, okay. Give me a little teaser well, there. How, how about how about we start the show off or the segment off with what you've been playing? You remember that segment that we used to do? Yes. Like what what have you been currently playing other than Destiny, my good man? Right, and it's been a minute since we've done that, so let's do that. Let's do that right, right. now. That's how that's how, that's how we'll tie things up. Well, my friend. Um, I have been checking out a lot of the Game Pass options. The Game Pass on Xbox has been pretty fruitful over the last couple months. They've freaking they've been stepping up their game, man. They've like up. I was telling, like I've been telling you, was telling you earlier. There's I'm I'm looking forward to quite a few titles that are coming like late July. 
Yeah, dude. I we've that's what's also cool is yeah we've we've gotten announcements of things coming to Game Pass too. It's not just uh oh what dropped this week, but like we're actually they're kind of like stoking the fires of what's coming. They're, um, they're giving they're giving the full like Netflix like roadmap calendar. Yeah, has it dropped or is it going to drop the replay you mentioned off air? Oh, is that no, coming? Uh, or... No, rare re- rare replay is on there currently. Okay, like I checked the front page and I I just kind of missed a few of the titles, but yeah, rare replay is on there right now, guys. For the you Game Pass holders, for that's sure. fu- that's cool. That's a game. Wor- that's a variety of games worth your time. That is a collection of thirty years of the company developer Rare and all their gems, their archive yep. of gems. A lot of good ones. I mean, I. <sighs> I was playing on it earlier today, and I didn't see Ukulele on there, but that is a fairly new title. I was going to say, that's kind of outside of the collection for what they yeah. did put together. Because yeah. um, they kind of they went back to, like, Classic Frogger. Uh, they went to Jet Force Gemini, which I was addicted to in the Nintendo 64 era. Hey, you know, and they're racing games, too. I'm just not a huge racer game, but I'm not. Di- I'm not dismissing those. You, well, you gotta yeah, point no, those the, out, dude. I'm not aware of all the, of them. I I don't remember what they were all. There's so many of them that they have on there that are kind of obscure that you really didn't didn't play too much. But they were. What was it? They've got. Hold on, I'm loading it up right now so that way I can give you... Oh, Battletoads, you got to cover that one too. Yes, I apologize. Shout out to Nick, one of yep. his favorites, Battletoads. Nick, Nick would for shame you for that one right there, my guy. Yeah. Battletoads. But it's like... the Con- They've also got a Conker's Bed for a day on there. I do have to give that one a big shout out to yep. my child. That one was good, dude. That's a good one. Um, right. Um, RC Pro AM and RC Pro AM2 are a couple of the racing games. And then there's also Killer Instinct on there. Um, All of the Banjo-Kazooie games, Banjo-Tooie, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've also got uh, Grab by the Ghoulies. That's a good one. Perfect Dark. I love Perfect Dark as well. The Viva Pinata series. They have those on there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then there's some some older titles up towards the front that are great as well. They've got uh, Digger T Rock. They've got Solar Jetman. There's like uh, looks like what is this called? Snake Rattle and Roll. Uh, cobra cobra triangle they've got a wide Uh, list Lynn. right slalom it looks like that old school like a skiing game for like the old school pcs where the yeti comes out and grabs you yep i don't know if a yeti comes out and grabs you in this one i honestly haven't played slalom in my life and i apologize it's a 19 1987 release, a year before I was born. Can't believe you never played a game that came out that long ago. <laughs> right? But anyway, dude. Yeah, Game Pass has had some gems. Uh, Rare Replay is incredible. That's out now. Uh, something else that, that popped up on my, hey, this is new on Game Pass not too long ago, uh, and I checked it out this week, is a game called SteamWorld Dig 2. Um, it's 2D side-scrolling platform. It's got some mild RPG elements. It's got mods in the form of cogs, cog mods. The reason being all the characters in this game are robots. It's kind of like a steampunk style, uh, robot characters. Very kind of like Claptrap from Borderlands. Very stylistic and goofy looking at times. Um... (laughs) You've got general skill upgrades. There's a, a driven story campaign here. 
uh, NPCs in the world. It's not super extensive on the RPG. It's just mild dialogue. You go up, to, you can walk up to a character, talk to them. They give you some basic information about what's going on or the area. Sometimes there's a two choice option on your dialogue. Uh, which gives it a little bit of a mild free form on the RPG element. Um, and it's just, it's super colorful. Uh, and it kind of, I'm trying to think of a similar game. Because one of the, it's called Dig. Uh, Steamroll Dig 2. So Steamroll definitely fits the atmosphere. And the dig part, your primary uh, equipment is a shovel. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the levels involve mining like digging through spots and what's creative about a lot of this platforming is there will be puzzles that you have to solve by digging to certain things to access certain switches or collect certain items so like you walk into an area and there will be a, a, a certain path you go and then there will be a few branching areas where you just tap the x button and you start throwing your shovel into a direction I'm trying to think of a game because it's it's side scrolling, so you can dig down side to side, or if there's a rock right above you, you can dig up one block, and they're kind of like in blocks. Are you thinking like Terraria? Yes, something similar to that, where you can kind of dig tunnels or dig through different areas and spots. It's kind of like that, but it's on a the scale is more up close and personal. You're kind of like the character is like bigger on screen and there's only like maybe, maybe 10 or 20 blocks wide by 10 or 20 blocks deep at any given time of what you're looking at. And so you, you never pull away really far from your character like Terraria where it's really far away. It's more up close. Anyway, it's a lot of fun and it's, and it's really interesting to try to solve some of like, there'll be a, a boss in the middle of a room. That's like, shooting blasters at you and as he's shooting he's destroying blocks of dirt around you in the direction you're in and if it eats away too much you're like well crap now i can't jump to him platform wise because it just destroyed this block so you kind of really have to think ahead of time it's a lot of mild strategy to working your way through these different dungeons and puzzles um a lot of color a lot of cartoon design to it that's fun uh and it's a fun fresh platform that i haven't really played anything similar to in a long time i'm thoroughly enjoying it right now i haven't gone through the whole thing or completed it so i'm, I'm gonna give it like an eight out of ten at the moment in just that it's a lot of fun and i want to keep with it uh and we'll see how we'll see how the game wraps up but that's steam world dig 2 currently on game pass um I've got one more mild thing to share, but uh, Lynn, I want to toss it over to you for a minute. What What's something you've checked out this week that's not new well, Let's see. I've actually done a couple of things. I've done one on PlayStation, and that was Detroit Becoming Human. Ooh. That one is... So if you've ever played Heavy Rain or... Uh, Beyond Two Worlds, or, or Two Souls, sorry. That, like, storytelling, you know, kind of the two tell or the... Telltale uh, games. Telltale games. You get a yeah, choice, kinda, like an action choice you got to make quickly. Yeah. And it's very story narrative driven. And it... Uh, I got to say, just the aesthetic appeal of Detroit Becoming Human and the story that it tells that... It, it tries to it tries to depict androids and humans as they're you know that thing that you always worry about where an AI becomes too self aware. In this, it depicts an AI that wants to be human because the things that it sees around it it would it would like to alter them as opposed to following a code that it has like commands and it can't deviate from that but in in this it actually allows you the ai to become self-aware and make that deviation to change 
that android's life for the better or for the worse depending on how, depending on how you choose to play and i've i've definitely got to say it's it's kind of sucked me in like it's you you become very immersed in it and you want to see what happens with all of the different characters throughout and i mean so far in the storyline i've come across the what is it there's the main detective at the beginning which isn't spoilers at all and then there's probably three three to four other characters that i've come across that you get to make choices for so far yeah. and it's just it it's crazy it it's super like there's that suspense to it there's the there's mild horror aspects to it and it not not safe to play around kids i will Mm. throw that out there at all because there is a large amount of blood and (laughs) violence and there is mild sexual content to it although it is android so i don't know how you might perceive take that yeah Yeah, that's one of those face value if there is real, is the, if there is similarly realistic as Westworld characters, I'd say yeah. that's probably not appropriate for kids. They're 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 very like Westworld developed. Um, yeah, anatomically but, but correct. All in all, I would definitely recommend a playthrough for the people that would enjoy a very immersive storyline. And a very well in depth developed storyline. This is a good one. Um, then the other one that I have played is an a gamer pass game, and that is Void Bastards. Hmm. It is it is a first person roguelike RPG. I know that's very long, but it starts off as you are a rehydrated prisoner that has been given the task of escaping from your current location. And you collect things throughout the galaxy on ships that are dead or what you think are dead that would benefit you as far as like in your game the cogs they are pieces of gear that give you certain bonuses Mm -hmm. because when your character dies another inmate is hydrated and that new inmate has a different set of perks or flaws like i had one who who was a smoker which is a terrible flaw to have if i can't remember (laughs) because with with the smoker flaw every like 15 to 20 seconds he would randomly cough and that gives away your location and when when you're trying to be sneaky having a character that's forced to cough every 15 to 20 seconds is very painful because you're going to try and find find a room where you can close the door and it's like soundproof and on a dead spaceship that has no power. That's very hard to do. Wow. So, but it, it has, it has all the first person shooter qualities. It is cell shaded. I don't know if that is necessarily a mood killer for a lot of people, but if you're a borderlands enthusiast, it is, a, a very well done thing and if you are a fan of the roguelike RPG style this is mm-hmm. definitely reminiscent of other roguelike RPG games it's I would say it is definitely worth at least one playthrough you will find yourself getting bored of it on the second playthrough mm. but it it's a good one. I I'd say give it a shot, especially if you like the 
cell shaded first person thing, kind of like Borderlands. It is not a looter shooter. I will not say that it is a roguelike RPG. So yeah. if you're looking for a change up from Borderlands, it don't is... do it. It's not it. Yeah. So those those are the those are the two big ones that I've really gotten into in the since we've talked last. Yeah. But I mean you also know that I've downloaded the rare replay. I did just download Black Ops four and I've been playing that with Matt and Doctor Confused for a little bit. Nice. And then that's, other than that, that's about it. Well, that's a good variety, dude. Um, I did... I won't review it yet because I haven't gotten into the meat of any missions. I just... There's such a depth to character creation at the beginning of this game that I just wanted to see how the opening elements started out. So I did give uh, Monster Hunter a chance, especially since they added it to Game Pass... Uh, Nick has Nick has played a considerable amount of it and has has bugged a bunch of us to hop on there with him because it does have multiplayer options of joining him in the field and hunting down massive creatures of prehistoric nature. Um, yeah. Emmett, Emmett and I have given we've played quite a bit of Monster Hunter. We played it on PlayStation first, and then yeah. when it was free on Xbox. We play, started playing it here too. Nice and and did like have those previous versions you played? Did they have the same kind of extensive like character creation, model creation, modifying? Well, they've had mild. Well, no. Since the first one for PS2 that I've played, it it had extensive character creation. So. Okay, because like, dude, this is like this is like Elder Scrolls level, like cheek well, depth, eyebrow it, movement. It, it didn't have, Yeah, it, it didn't have <laughs> that extensive in the first one. It, it's got like <laughs> it's got certain presets in the first one for PS2. Sure, but. yeah, and this one has. So I'll just throw this out there. This one has presets, and as far as like color for facial hair and skin tone and everything. You can pick from a color palette where you can pick a, a you know a preset color, or you can go to the 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 color flare. flare where you can literally move the cursor across it to get an exact tone or shade of a color. It's very ridiculous with how much. I mean, it's cool, but there's a lot to it if you really want to like either create something fantastically out there and alien or make something super close and resemblant of yourself, you can really take the time and do that. Like you could get real close and make your own face in the game. If you really took the time to move the adjusters and the colors and all everything, but because you can even adjust like the age of the character's skin and stuff like that, general stuff. But so I spent a little bit of time there. I launched into the tutorial, tried out a handful of the weapons. Uh, the movement and stuff is a lot of fun. Haven't jumped, didn't jump into a mission yet. So just kind of wanted to just throw that out there that it's a game I'm gonna put a little little time in more and then come back with you guys to give you guys a, a better feel for my review or score on it. But it seems like a lot of fun. And Lynn, you have experience with previous titles and and you've had fun with them so yeah i've got i've i've got titles from ps2 to psp to i've even played some of the ones for the wii as well yeah on monster Hunter. nice i think it's it's fair to say uh if you've already got game pass you're not wasting anything but time and download to try yeah. it out so it it does seem like a lot of fun and it's been reviewed it, high, so. Warning, it is a time sink. It is one of the farmy, farmier games. Yeah, and I can kind of get that feel from the onset. But it is, it like, when you do farm all the components for a, a good set of gear, it is worth it. Because once you do get that gear, you look pretty badass. Nice. 
I'll take that into consideration for future time put into it. But, um, let, I mean, do you got, oh my goodness. I do have one that I would like to talk about from E3, and that was the From Software George R. R. Martin collab in a fantasy Dark Souls style game. Uh, do you know anything about this, or are you just excited about the potential for it? I am excited for the potential. Don't Hold know on. too much we'll detail. There. I'll get back to you in a second, kid. Sorry, I have to hard cut that, Lynn. <laughs> go ahead, finish but, what you're saying. Okay. Sorry. I'll I'll go back to it. I I don't know too much more about it other than what was shown at E3, but the potential has very high height train killing itself capabilities. Yeah. Because if he is unable to write a storyline for a <laughs> book, how can he write a storyline for a game? I'm just, I, I kid, I'm just kidding. It will probably turn out great. And so I, w- I look forward to it. I, I love from software games like Sekiro. I have dumped quite a bit of time into that game on PlayStation because that's the copy that I own. But nice. I mean, I, I also bought a copy of it for Xbox. But I love that franchise and I look forward to it. So that's yeah, dude. I'm we'll keep we'll keep tabs on it in the future. Um. Because I, I am intrigued by the idea of it in seeing what this is. But you, you, made a, you make a good point, dude. Like, if you can't even finish his books or <laughs> contribute heavily to what was a successful show based on the books that he doesn't have finished, why, why does he keep doing this, dude? Why does he keep spending time getting involved in other projects. I know they're pay- I know he's probably making some money doing it, but it's like dude, you're you were an author first. Just finish your damn books. Well maybe he had another story written and then this game is based on that story. I mean I'm not against it. But Lynn, I mean you're you're doing I've heard uh, other friends refer to this whole perspective you're delivering as as being somewhat of a... uh, You're doing the Care Bear Stare right now here, dude. The Care Bear Stare. You're uh, (laughs) a... I'm not a Care Bear. Positivity! (laughs) Everything's worth a chance! (laughs) I'm uh, I'm kidding. I'm yeah, I, I get you. I get you. I was saying, I was, yeah, I mean, Care Bears are completely out of context, but it was for the uh, the idea and effect that I yeah, think you're I giving him more credit than he's due. <laughs> Fair enough. That's just an opinion, as is yours. Yeah. I, I have no grounds to base that on. But, guys, I think it is... Time to wrap this thing up that we call Medentials for today. Uh, it's been fun. We covered all three topics, a variety of different things, had a lengthy conversation in Movie Matters. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I had fun, Lynn, talking. Oh, for sure. Definitely covered some good stuff today. Definitely some good stuff. Well, as yeah. always, we would like to hear your two cents. I mean, I'll give I'll give you a penny for your thoughts, or but a few pennies if you guys want. Come on, and you know, if you do leave us some feedback, we will more than likely, well, not more than likely, we will bring it up and thank you and credit you for your opinion in the next episode. Yeah, so it's pretty leave much that a feedback. Guarantee. I mean, whether it is negative or positive, we do appreciate it one way or another. That way we can see the other side to the story because there's, you know, there's two only lanes. so many angles we can, we can yeah. speak on. Lynn, there's there's two, two lanes to every street. Let's take it. 
where can they leave some of that feedback? What's what's a what's a primary source that would be good for them to do so? Well, they can hit us on our our Twitter accounts. I'm Lynn Pay to Have Fun. I you're you're still Blue Mr. Streak. Blue Streak. Right? That still rings Mr. true. Blue Streak. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah. Nick is Thanatos DB87, right? Yeah, yeah. Those that's still active. And uh, and uh, uh, at Matt Men Origins actually is Matthew. Yeah, there you go. And then there's the Nerdentials. You can at also Nerdentials, if you guys uh, are into that. You can check us out on our website, nerdentialsmedia.com. Dot com. Or you can go to our Facebook account, Nerdentials. Just search us there. I mean, you could probably yes. Google search Nerdentials and you'll probably find some form of connecting to us. We, exactly. I mean, if we're being honest here. And I, if, there, and if, if you, you do find someone on Google that is not us, but posing as us, <laughs> leave, please leave them all your <laughs> Oh, and Lynn, if they want to go old school, if they want to do a classic email, oh, they can hit us yeah. up. Nerdentials at gmail.com. If you guys are feeling like being on the edge of old school, you can always do that. If you're feeling squirrely and you want to leave us an email, go for it. I mean, we'll read I guarantee we'll read it and probably even share it, most likely. Guaranteed. Nearly guaranteed. No, we will share it. We will. There's no getting around it. It'll get shared. It'll Thank get you. Shared. It will. Uh, but, Lynn, it's been fun tonight. Thank you for joining me in this conversation of topics. For sure. Uh, guys, I think this is where we bid everyone adieu for me, myself, and I. Oh, and Lynn. Because uh, because there are two separate individuals here. Uh, this has been your nerdy essentials. And as always, nerds, we will see you on, on the, the other side. side. Was there some epic intention on that on that delay, or is that how long it took you to hear me? That's how long it took me to hear you. Man. <laughs>